Okay. Hello. Um, so, uh, as usual, I'll start by asking if there are any questions about the course in general or anything like that. Mute all the participants. Okay. Um, so, uh, Nelson Goodman, um, he was an American philosopher. He died in 1998, um, but at the age of 92, I guess. So, um, he was active more, especially in the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, he was an associate of uh, Quine, who we're going to be reading after this. And he was also one of the teachers of Hilary Putnam. Um, and... Uh, we're going back in time somewhat by reading this book. Um, so this this book, Fact, Fiction, and Forecast, was was published first published in 1953, but um, um, it's based on things that Goodman was already saying earlier. And actually, the first time Carnap responded to an argument like this was 1947. So um, as you recall, the Carnap we read. Uh, last time was from 1956, so this is actually going back. So I mean, Goodman is actually criticizing a slightly early, earlier, or maybe a lot earlier stage of Carnap than Putnam is. Um, nevertheless, why did I put Putnam first before Goodman and Quine? I guess I think of Goodman and Quine as like Carnap's main successors and critics and Putnam as more like a secondary or uh, like an interesting other perspective, but I'm not sure I can really back it up more than that. In any case, um, <clears throat> that's we are, are where we are now. And um, at least if you have the book I ordered, you'll notice that it has also actually has a foreword by Hilary Putnam that he wrote in 1983. So it's a later version of Putnam commenting on this, um, which might be interesting to read if you, if you want. Um, okay, but I'm just going to start talking about the contents of um, Fact, Fiction, and Forecast, Chapter 2. Chapter one is all about counterfactuals. Um, it's uh, actually an important text in the history of analytic philosophy, but probably less relevant to this course than chapters two, three, and four. Um, and chapters two, three, and four are pretty self-contained. They don't rely on what he said in chapter one. So, um, okay, so first of all, like when, uh, you start reading this, it can, it might seem like there's no continuity with what came before, like the subject has been completely changed. Um, but I think if you pay more attention, you'll see that um, uh, Goodman in many ways is directly responding to Carnap. Um, and I mean, the most, the bro on the broadest level, I can say that Goodman definitely belongs in this part of the course because the issue here is again about what makes concepts legitimate in some sense. Um, and it's about what makes uh, the concepts of science, modern science especially, or it's it's about the idea that modern science works with legitimate concepts and that's what makes it especially rational. 
Um, although also as in Carnap, there isn't a sharp line between science and common sense, right? It's assumed that also our, you know, our ordinary way of talking about the world also involves basically legitimate concepts and the use of illegitimate ones is, um, turns up mostly in what Goodman, like Carnap, calls metaphysics. Um, okay, so that's, that's by way of saying that overall this is part of the same project. Um, now, uh, the big problem that Goodman is going to raise for that overall project, and chapter two is kind of setting up for this, whereas chapter three is raising it explicitly, and then chapter four is Goodman's response. So, um, so what I'm going to say now is a little bit of a preview. Um, but so the overall problem that Goodman is going to raise um, for this view is, um, for example, uh, suppose I have a certain copper wire on my table and I find that it conducts electricity. So that is a piece of evidence Carnap and Goodman agree. We'll see that Popper disagrees, but, but Carnap and Goodman agree, and it seems reasonable on the face of it. That's a piece of evidence for the general statement that all copper conducts electricity. Right? I mean, it's only a small piece. I only found that this one copper wire conducts electricity, but it's a little piece of evidence in favor of the general statement that all copper conducts electricity. On the other hand, suppose there's a whole bunch of other stuff on my table. Is the fact that this copper wire conducts electricity a piece of evidence for the general statement, everything on my table conducts electricity? Meaning that if I bring something from somewhere else that's not on my table <clears throat> and doesn't conduct electricity, I have some evidence that when I bring it to my table, it will. Because I have some evidence for the general law, everything on my table conducts electricity. So the answer to that seems to be, no, it's not evidence for that. Um, and in fact, maybe no evidence could support that. And this isn't exactly how Goodman is going to put it, but I think that this is kind of what his objection tends to show, um, that, uh, the concept thing on my table is not a legitimate concept for these purposes. Right? It's not usable by science in the way the concept copper is. Um, even though, well, so first of all, even though it's a perfectly observable property of things, right? It's, I mean, it's in principle verifiable whether something's on my table or not using sense data, whatever. Um, so, um, so it seems to um, not be susceptible to Carnap's strategy in that sense, but also, um, and this is going to be like the main point of chapter three, it doesn't seem like there's any syntactical way of distinguishing between these prop between a, set a sentence like this thing is on my table and this thing is copper. Um, so it seems like uh, from both the point of view of like trying to build this rule into the language and the point of view of trying to connect it to verifiability, it seems like Carnap's strategy for identifying legitimate concepts isn't going to work. Okay, so uh, like I said, that problem is not raised directly in chapter two, but he's preparing for that 
problem by what he does in chapter 2. Are there questions about that before I go on to discuss what he does say in chapter 2? Okay. Um, well, um, so first of all, as you can tell from the beginning here, uh, I mean, that is even from the beginning of the chapter, Goodman is not just broadly on the same page as Carnap, but there's actually a lot of ways in which in detail they're trying to do the same thing. And um, this isn't surprising. Actually, in 1951, Goodman published a book called The Structure of Appearance, which is, um, um, well, which he says, right, I mean, that is, he actually says in the introduction that this is what it is. It's basically an attempt to do the project of the Aufbau correctly. Like to, to he identified certain problems, tried to fix them up, changed the ascension forms, et cetera, et cetera, and tries to show how, what like a better way to start out a system like that would be. So he's definitely engaged with the details of Carnap's project and not just with um, the overall aims. Um, and in particular, so um, what Goodman says at the very beginning of the reading um, is um, that the project, the task of philosophy is what he calls explication or actually I guess at the beginning he says explanation otherwise other places he calls it explication um, um, and what this is, is basically the same thing that uh, Carnap calls rational reconstruction. Um, um, and it, by the way, I guess that in fact, Many, although not all, analytic philosophers would still agree that the task of philosophy is something like this. Um, so it involves um, taking all the predicates we use in uh, science and or in everyday life and um, taking the ones that are in some sense unclear or Goodman calls them inacceptable. And uh, explaining them in terms of the ones that are acceptable. So, uh, that is uh, saying what we mean by a certain questionable term in, uh, in a way that allows us to replace it or at least uh, um, give some clues to the meaning for it in terms of uh, acceptable terms. Um, and uh, um, moreover, Goodman agrees with Carnap that the way we have to do this is that, um, that our explanations have to preserve the extension of the terms that we're trying to explain. Right, so, so this, this is the same as what Carnap in the Aufbau called preserving logical meaning. Right, you have some questionable term, you know, uh, um, well, maybe I should use it. You have some questionable term T, 
you want to find a way of replacing sentences like this, tx, with sentences that don't involve t and just you know, involve a bunch of other acceptable terms, a, b, c. Um, and you want this translation sentence to be true in all the cases where this sentence is true and false in all the cases where this sentence is false. Right, I'm not, actually, I don't really have a good notation. I mean, it's possible to develop a good notation for writing this, but, but I don't have one waiting that you would understand. So the point is, right, this is a sentence that says something about X, not using T, but using these other acceptable predicates, A, B, C, et cetera. So, right, so this, this whole thing is a sentence that's either true or false, and that if I plug in a value for X, I'll either get true or false. And this one also is a sentence that's either true or false. And if I plug in a value for x, I'll either get true or false. And what we want to preserve is um, um, the extension of t, that is, the set of values for x that make tx true. We want that to be the same as the extension of whatever complicated thing we're saying about x on the other side. And that's all we have to preserve. Right, so it doesn't have to be the case that that it, these that this complicated statement kind of seems to mean the same thing as t or x. Um, it just uh, it just has to be true in the same cases. Um, and. Uh, Right, Goodman says that explicitly. <clears throat> well, maybe it's not worth showing you that in the book, but Goodman says that explicitly in next week's reading in the note on page 65, um, that what we're trying to do is preserve extension. So, um, so that, again, recall, that's exactly what reduction or rational reconstruction is supposed to do in the Aufbau. Um, when you replace uh, like the predicate um, is a snake, or sorry, is a rattlesnake with the predicate has rattles on the end of its tail, um, we don't worry about whether it doesn't it mean something different to say it's a rattlesnake than to say it has rattles on its tail? We just worry about whether the things we call rattlesnakes are exactly the same as the things that have rattles on their tail. Um, and any other indicator we have would also work. Doesn't matter as long as it preserves the extension. So that's what Goodman is thinking that we need to do. And um, just, I am going to show you this in the book. So, um, a philosophic problem is a call to provide an adequate explanation in terms of an acceptable basis, right? That term basis is Carnap's term. Um, and, um, The, the change here is the change from uh, acceptable versus, I mean, the, the change from, uh, um, let's say, observational versus theoretical to acceptable versus unacceptable. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that is supposed to be what the acceptable-inacceptable distinction replaces. 
um, as you can see from the next paragraph. Yet I am afraid that we are nowhere near having any sound general principle for drawing this line, that is the, the line between acceptable and unacceptable. Surely I, not, I need not in this place and before this audience, these were originally given as lectures, Surely I need not in this place and before this audience recount the tragic history of the verification theory of meaning. Right? So what he's saying is, you know, the, um, the old idea was that the acceptable terms are the ones that are clearly verifiable and the unacceptable ones are ones that seem not to be verifiable. And the explanation consists of eliminating those unacceptable terms, showing how to define them away using only the acceptable terms, and therefore you show that what you want to say is verifiable. But he says here that unfortunately the tragic history, I guess it's tragic because he agrees that it was a noble cause, <laughs> but he thinks that it, it didn't work. That makes it a, a tragedy. Um, and, uh, and he refers to, in a footnote to, um, various stuff from the later forties and fifties where people, uh, discuss the fact that verificationism is not working out. Um, right. So, so this distinction between unacceptable and acceptable, um, is not exactly the same. It can't just be replaced with a distinction between uh, not clearly verifiable and clearly verifiable or something like that. But it's intended to do what we were, the same thing we were trying to do, according to Goodman, with that older distinction. Um, why he says unacceptable rather than unacceptable. Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I have something to say about it later, but my at least uh, something more to say about it later, but at least my, my main thir first thought about it is that maybe unacceptable he takes to mean like unacceptable ever, whereas unacceptable means unacceptable without some explanation, right? So we're gonna make it acceptable by providing the explanation. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure why unacceptable would mean that more than unacceptable, but uh, I'm not sure what unacceptable, I mean, unacceptable isn't, uh, normal words. <laughs> I'm not sure what it usually means. All right. Um, um, okay. So, right. So, so, so in that sense, the thing we're trying to do is the same here or is supposed to be a um, continuation of the same thing. Um, and moreover, the method we're going to use is the same. It's the same as Carnap's method of the Aufbau, namely to eliminate, I think I already said this, to eliminate the unacceptable terms by means of definitions that allow us to write, to replace them with acceptable terms. And the result that um, Goodman envisions is the same result that Carnap is heading for in the Aufbau. So um, let me show you a couple other things in the book here. Um, so here he's talking about dispositional terms as something unacceptable without explanation. That's of course, is the main topic of the chapter. He's trying to eliminate those. Um, but he says here in a footnote, a predicate like Ben's, for example, may be dispositional under a phenomenalistic system. Um, 
and there may be no terms that are manifest, as there are no terms that are primitive for all systems. So the result of getting this to work is going to be something he calls a system. Remember, that's the same thing Carnap called it, right? like choice of system form, choice of basis for our system, right? We're going to set up a system. Which things ha are going to be eliminated in favor of which is going to depend on what basis we choose for the system. We can choose a phenomenalistic basis. That's basically the same thing that Carnap calls Oh, someone says, I thought it was because un is a German root word, root word, and in is a Latin word, root word, or word root. Also, in seems more restrictive than un. Well, why he would choose, I mean, yes, I guess that's true. Un is Germanic. And in is Latin. But uh, unless maybe he's suggesting that since acceptable is Latin, you shouldn't put un with it, but rather in. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why that's, there might be a reason it's relevant, but I'm not sure why. Um, also, in seems more restrictive than un. More restrictive meaning it's even less acceptable. I was suggesting it's that unacceptable is, so to speak, more acceptable than unacceptable. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, yes, there are a lot of differences between these words. I, I'm, I'll say something else about it later, like I said. Um, but so anyway, that was on page 41. Now, and then on page 49, he says something that's even closer to Carnap. Suppose we are using not a physicalistic thing language, but a phenomenalistic language for which the atomic elements are places in the visual field, moments of phenomenal time, minimal phenomenal colors, sounds, etc. In a footnote, such a system is outlined in the structure of appearance. Right? So not only does he call it a system, like as Carnap does, he calls it a language, and those two are interchangeable here. And the choice here is between a phenomenalistic language, which is basically a version of what Carnap calls an auto-psychological language, or um, a physicalistic language or system. Right, so the, so the result that, the type of result that Goodman has in mind here is the, the method is the same and the desired result is the same. Um, <laughs> Latin roots and German prefixes are unacceptable. <laughs> right. Um, um, I mean, there, there can actually be an issue about that. Uh, and sometimes when you do it, it's ridiculous. Like that example from The Simpsons. You guys, I don't know if, you, if, if old Simpsons references are familiar to you or not. Probably not. But there's something about the term embiggened. <laughs> this has been embiggened. <laughs> uh, Sometimes it can sound ridiculous, but in this case, unacceptable sounds acceptable. Anyway, be that as it may. Um, so, so there's a lot of continuity here, but on the other hand, something big has changed, and um, it surfaces with respect to exactly what is the main topic of the chapter. So um, that's lucky because that means I will start talking about the main topic of the chapter now rather than the last five minutes of lecture. Um, and the main topic of the chapter is disposition terms. Remember I talked about this a little bit before. It was a big deal at some earlier stage in the history of logical positivism. By the time we get to the methodological character paper, it's kind of a footnote. Like, oh yeah, we could treat these terms differently. Um, um, but so, um, um, 
I mean, Goodman refers to the paper Testability and Meaning, which is the main, which is the place where this is the main issue for Carnap, disposition terms. And, uh, okay, so what is the issue about them? So, um, so the question is, suppose we want to eliminate a predicate like, uh, and I'm going to use, rather than Carnap's example, I'm going to use Goodman's example, flexible. So, right, so QD of XT is going to mean um, X is flexible at time T. So we want to uh, um, reduce this to some other terms. And um, the obvious way you might at first think of reducing it to other terms is to say, well, let's, in, let's introduce two more terms that we're going to try to eliminate this in favor of. So the first one I'm going to call C, and C X of T will mean um, X is under suitable pressure at T. Now, I mean, you might say suitable, that's kind of vague. Don't we want to do this more precisely? So, I mean, I think this is a difference and maybe this puts Neurot, I mean, uh, Goodman more on Neurot's side in some respect, um, but it's a difference between the way Goodman and a lot of later people are thinking about this and the way Carnap at least originally thought about it, which is, and the way he's thinking about it, I believe is this, flexible itself is kind of vague. Right? That is, if you ask, is this flexible or not? Well, you know, for it to be flexible, it has to bend when you put a certain amount of pressure on it. How much pressure, though? You know, it depends what we're talking about and why. Right? So, like, normally we'd say a steel beam is not flexible, even though it will bend if you press it hard enough. Right? So, but in some contexts, we might want to say that a steel beam is flexible compared to, you know, so like in a huge earthquake, the steel beams will bend back and forth, whereas if they were made of stone, they would break, right? So the steel is flexible and the stone isn't, right? So that vagueness is being built into our definition by including the vague word suitable. So this is a feature, not a bug. Right? We want the definition to be just as vague. We want the extension of the definition to be just as vague as the, origin, the extension of the original term was, basically. Okay, so that's one of our predicates. I guess there's no reason for me to write them all twice. And the other one is going to be... Um, well, actually, you know what? You know, he doesn't include time to say X is flexible. And the other one is going to be x bends at time t. OK, so those are the three predicates we're working with. And the, I, the question is going to be, can we get rid of this one in favor of those? And the first way you think of doing this, according to both Carnap and Goodman, is to say something like this. For all t, or let's say, qdx is equivalent to, by definition, for all t, If X is under suitable pressure at time T, then 
then x bends at t. Right, hopefully Phil 9 memories will help you make sense of this sentence again, right? So it's saying that to translate it into better English, you'd say something like, whenever x has been under suitable pressure, it has bent. Or to make it less uh, present oriented, you know, whenever throughout its existence, x is under suitable pressure, it bends. If so, then it's flexible. If not, then it's not flexible. So flexible is equivalent to this. That's what we're trying. That's like what we first try. Oh. Inacceptable is also French for, right. Well, that would make sense because French is not a Germanic language like English. All right. Um, uh, all right, so, um, but this doesn't work because uh, take something that's never been under suitable pressure. So take a steel beam that's never, assuming that suitable is being defined now in such a way that a steel beam is supposed to count as not flexible or inflexible. So, um, um, take a steel beam that has never been under suitable pressure. No one's ever tried to bend it with their hands, let's say. So that means that this antecedent here is always false for all t, right? There is no time at which this x was under suitable pressure, and therefore this indicative conditional as Goodman calls it, and as other people call it, right? If it's under pressure, it bends, is always true because it was never, it's never under pressure. Um, and if the antecedent is false, then whether the consequent is true or false, the conditional is true. Right? Or again, to put it in more like, usual English, you could say, well, it has bent every time it was under suitable pressure, namely never, <laughs> right? So this definition doesn't give us a way for distinguishing among things that are not under suitable pressure ever, which ones are flexible and which ones are not. That's why we can't use that definition even though it looks good to begin with. Are there questions about that? Because, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty important to understand why this try doesn't work to then see what Carnap and Goodman each try to do here. So what Carnap tries to do instead is he gives up on Right? I mean, we saw him giving up on that in a big way in the later paper in 1956, but already in Testability and Meaning, which is, I forget, I think it's late 30s. Um, so uh, already in Testability and Meaning, Carnap gives up on the idea of eliminating this term QD, by, right? That is, we're not going to have a definition that allows us to take every sentence that contains a part like QDX, right? X is flexible and replace it by something else so that our sentences won't have flexible in them at all anymore. Instead, Carnap suggests, um, quote unquote, introducing this disposition term, right? Introducing, that's the language of fictitious constructive operations or something like that. Right. Historically speaking, we had this, we already have this term and we're trying to do a rational reconstruction, but we're thinking of it as if we never had it and we're introducing it for the first time. Uh, remember how Putnam complained about that. But anyway, um, and this is how he proposes to introduce it.
So for all x, for all t, if x is under suitable pressure at time t, then Then x is flexible if and only if x bends at time t. Right? So it says, um, here's this new term we're introducing, flexible. And now I'm going to tell you something about what it means, but not everything. This is only partial interpretation, <laughs> right? I'm going to tell you something about what it means. And what I'm going to tell you is that if you find a situation where x is under suitable pressure, then under in those circumstances, you can treat x is flexible as equivalent to x bend. What about the situation where x is not under suitable pressure? It doesn't tell you what to do. Right? So again, it only tells you something about what um, flexible means. But it tells you something about it. Now, I mean, from Carnap's point of view, um, and well, I, I guess maybe I should add already, moreover, suppose later on we start thinking, well, you know, the reason this rubber thing bends under suitable pressure is because, or at least is associated with these other characteristics it has. Um, something about what type of material it is, basically. Um, so on that basis, we can say, well, um, you know, and that's why we call rubber flexible even when it's not under suitable pressure and there and is not bending because, um, well, whether it's bending or not, even when it's not under suitable pressure, we call it flexible because it has these characteristics that are associated with flexibility. It's the same type of stuff as this rubber that is under suitable pressure and is bending. So how can we take advantage of that um, knowledge or uh, um, uh, tendency to speak in a certain way or whatever it is that we have, well, we can always add more things like this, right? So we can always add another one that says, and by the way, under these circumstances, so like this, it could be something like when a, cer it's a certain solvent is applied to it, then being flexible is equivalent to dissolving, right? That, that's an example of something we might add, right? And that means like we have a new test without putting like any pressure on this, on this thing. We can see if it dissolves in this solution. And if it does, we say, oh, so it's rubber or it's like rubber in such a way that we expect it would bend under suitable pressure. Um, but um, that last thing I just said was a counterfactual, right? If it were under suitable pressure, which it's not, it would bend, which it's not. <laughs> um, we don't want to say those, Carnap and Goodman agree. Um, so, but instead we're doing something else. We're saying, and we also call it flexible if it has such and such chemical properties. So we can add more and more of these reduction sentences, as Carnap calls them. And the more we have, the more explanation we'll have for the way scientists use the term flexible, basically, or scientists or everyday people in everyday life. 
Um, and all of this is okay from Carnap's point of view. And this is why I emphasized this so much before. That all of this is okay from Carnap's point of view because remember, what he really cares about is whether we know when someone asks, is this flexible? whether we have some idea for how to begin collecting evidence for and against that statement. And if we have a bunch of reduction sentences like this, we do have some idea, right? We can start checking whether any of these conditions hold. Or if they don't, we can try to bring them about, right? We can try to make them hold. So um, we might or may not be able to, right? Maybe none of them hold and we're not able to bring it about that any of them hold. And then, you know, we won't know whether it's flexible or not. But um, when the term is introduced by these kind of reduction sentences, every time you put in another one, you're giving another way of, of um, verifying the sentence. It's not completely verifiable or falsifiable, but it's, we have methods for doing it. And as I pointed out, even in the strict verification of Aufbau system, that's all really we practically have anyway. Right, because the way in principle, again, of telling whether something meets a certain constructive defin constructional definition or not, um, may often involve gathering much more evidence than I actually really could gather. So um, all, I, all I ever have is um, the possibility of um, not telling for sure whether every statement is true or false, but knowing how I might, in principle, go about collecting evidence for or against it. And these reduction sentences preserve that, so according to Carnap, they're okay. But now, and this is where, as I promised, you can see that something big has changed between Goodman and Carnap. Um, according to Goodman, this is not okay because we're still left with this unacceptable term. Flexible. Why is this term itself unacceptable. Um, and so even though there's, again, there's supposed to be some connection between this observable, non-observable, or, oh, hold on a second, I have to plug my computer in. Even though um, there's supposed to be some continuity between the observable, directly observable, not directly observable distinction and the acceptable, unacceptable distinction, um, it doesn't seem like the reason we're interested in that distinction is the same as it was before. And um, so let me show you something else from the book again. Um, this is on page 41. It's a different thing from page 41 than I showed you before. Here he's talking about why, like, what you might think of as a manifest predicate, like red, actually is itself also a dispositional predicate. Um, but um, what I'm interested in is what he says is wrong with that. For even the manifest properties we have illustrated are hardly to be countenanced as elements of our universe. Um, we're trying to get rid of unacceptable terms because we don't want to add unacceptable elements to our universe. Um, that obviously is something that Carnap would not say, right? That's what Carnap would call metaphysics. Um, according to Carnap, um, 
you know, uh, the choice of a language is not a choice of what elements to add to our universe. It's just a choice of which language to speak. The question of, are there actually such things as whatever the terms of the language talk about is metaphysical, therefore meaningless. It's not a question at all. So um, um, Goodman, from some point of view, now, I mean, Goodman and Quine agree about this, and they worked on common projects because of this, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing by it at all. <laughs> um, but Goodman and Quine agree, you know, the real problem here is to get rid of, um, Quine calls them unruly entities, <laughs> not allow them into our ontology. So from that point of view, it is um, not true at all that this reduction sentence is just as good as an eliminative definition, right? On the contrary, um, um, the eliminative definition makes it clear that we're not talking about those unruly entities, really, or that we don't have to think we're talking about them. Um, whereas this one doesn't tell us how to do that. Okay, are there questions about this so far? I've basically talked about what are the continuities between Carnap and Goodman? And what is the, or given a sign that something big has changed? By the way, I should add maybe that um, um, when Goodman himself describes this disagreement that he and Carnap have about whether these sentences are good, he presents it somewhat misleadingly, I think, or he presents it in his terms rather than Carnap's, so to speak, right? Um, this is, uh, I'm not going to read it, but it's, he discusses on page 46 to 7 and in footnote, especially in footnote 11 on page 47, and he basically makes it look like a technical confusion on Carnap's part about... Um, whether there's anything in between introducing a term as a primitive versus introducing it by definition, right? So introducing a term of a primitive means, as a primitive, into our system means I just start using it. Um, whereas introducing it by definition means I, um, when I introduce it, I tell you how you could eliminate it in terms of the old terms, so it's just a kind of abbreviation. Right? And so, you know, Goodman says, and there's nothing in between those two. So, you know, um, if the point were, as Goodman thinks it is, to make the language not talk about this, then, of course, um, you know, there's nothing in between the language talks about it, and we don't know how to make it not talk about it, which is introducing it as a primitive, versus the language talks about it, but we know how to translate it into a language that doesn't talk about it, which is introducing it by definition, right? But if, again, but if from Carnap's point of view, the question is not how to make the language not talk about this unacceptable entity, the question is how to make sure that whatever the language says about it is testable, I mean, that's why the title of that paper that Goodman is criticizing is Testability and Meaning, <laughs> right? That's what makes the term meaningful, that the sentences that contain it are testable. And from that point of view, um, yes, there is something in between giving no instructions for testing it, which is introducing it as a primitive, and giving complete instructions for testing it in every case, which is introducing it by a limited definition, and what's in between is this, right? So it's not really the technical issue that's between them there. 
it's really the issue I'm talking about, or why we're doing this, or something like that. Okay. Um, so, um, so anyway, this approach is not acceptable to Goodman. What does he propose that we do instead? Um, um, so he considers a bunch of strategies and right. I would really like to erase all of this, only I'm going to want to use these predicates again. I guess I'm... I should kind of write it on the side here. Um, so, um, uh, Goodman, again, recognizing the fact that that original attempt in terms of the indicative conditional, right, where I just said flexible means that every time it's under suitable pressure, it bends. Um, recognizing that that won't work, he tries a bunch of other things. So one would be I'll just to eliminate flexible in favor of a counter. This is a C. In to, in, to eliminate X is flexible, not in, to, not in favor of an indicative conditional. If X is under suitable pressure, X bends, but in favor of a counterfactual conditional. If X were under suitable pressure, then X would bend. But Goodman says, no, because counterfactual statements are also unacceptable. Right or counterfactual predicates like X would bend are unacceptable. How do we know they're unacceptable? I'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right. Number two. Um, he considers. replacing statements involving flexible with statements about possibility. So you could replace it with something like, it is possibly under suitable pressure and bending, and it is not possibly under suitable pressure and not bending. Right, so that you could, I hope you can see why that would be a good translation of flexible. Right, it is, it's impossible for it to be under suitable pressure and not bend. But it's possible for it to be under suitable pressure and bend. Why do you have to add that part? Because otherwise it, it would be flexible something, if there's something that is impossible to put under suitable pressure, then it would be flexible. We don't want that. Right, so that's why I need both parts. If you didn't follow that, don't worry about it. So anyway, the point is using possibility would be another way of eliminating this term flexible and being left only with our manifest predicates. Manifest is what Goodman uses as the opposite of dispositional. The manifest predicates is under suitable pressure and bends. But Goodman says, no, possibility, possible states of affairs, the predicate possible, are unacceptable, so this won't work either. And then thirdly, it says real properties. 
right? He um, he considers that you get rid of it um, in favor of talking about uh, a property that really belongs to this piece of rubber. Let's say it's a piece of rubber, and it's the very property that causes the bending when it's under suitable pressure, right? So we figure out what it is about a thing that causes it to bend when it's under suitable pressure. And we define flexible to mean that. So this sounds promising because um, uh, it seems like what you know. Why do we want to say this piece of rubber is flexible, even though it's not bending and it's not under suitable pressure? Well, because it's the kind of thing that would bend if it were under suitable pressure. Well, that's the counterfactual. We don't want that. But what do we mean by that? Well, we mean it has whatever um, characteristics something has to have in order to bend under suitable pressure. We identify that, and that's what we mean by flexible. So Goodman says, this is no good too, either, because properties or classes, if they're, if they're not eliminable, are also examples of unacceptable entities. All right, so how can we do this? We want to translate this, therefore, into indicative as opposed to counterfactual statements about actual as opposed to possible concrete things as opposed to universals, right? We want to replace the statement X is flexible with a statement about X that doesn't refer to anything that's merely possible but not actual, that doesn't refer to any counterfactual state of affairs, and that doesn't refer to any properties or universals. So how are we going to do this? So, um, So the first move is to introduce a special new manifest predicate, which I'm going to call Q sub M. Right, so Q sub M is defined, something X is Q sub M at a time T if it is both under suitable pressure at time T and bends at time T. Now, I mean, uh, Goodman actually, for the purpose of talking about this, gets rid of the T, which makes things complicated by just saying, oh, let's talk about, instead of the whole duration of things, let's just talk about temporal segments of them. Right? Like, the, you know, this thing as it existed between two times that are close to, together. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think... In this context, that, that raises particular issues or is particularly helpful at the level of detail I'm going to go into, so I'm just going to ignore that. But, um, right, so something flexes at a certain time t. That's the word he introduces, right? So notice, flex is not supposed to be a normal word. 
just says this is not a normal predicate, right? We don't normally have a word that we use for things that are um, under suitable pressure and bending. We're introducing a word for that, and the word we're introducing is flexes, right? So to say that something flexes, it's not the same as bends. Why is it not the same as bends? Well, um, some things bend even though they're not under suitable pressure, right? I mean, I guess some things bend even though they're not under any pressure, and some things bend only because they're under extraordinary pressure, as he calls it, not suitable pressure, right? So flexes doesn't mean the same thing as bends. Flexes means bends under suitable pressure. But it doesn't mean the same thing as flexible either, right? So it doesn't mean the same thing as bends, but it doesn't mean the same thing as flexible either, because something that's not under suitable pressure can be flexible. That's the whole issue here, right? Whereas something that's not under suitable pressure doesn't flex. It's not flexing. <laughs> okay. Um, so do people understand what flex means? Because I think you know, I've noticed there's a lot of confusion about this in the past. <laughs> Why flex is different from bends and also different from flexible. So, um, we want to use this new predicate flex as the basis for getting to our definition of flexible. And the basic idea, I mean, this is like the thing about real properties, but we're supposed to avoid the problems of that. The basic idea is to uh, figure out what the things that flex have in common. And then, um, call all the things that aren't under suitable pressure, but have those same things in common, flexible. Um, so uh, maybe I'm gonna draw a picture of this. And I guess I'm gonna have to erase this stuff now. I hope that's not going to cause a problem. If it does, I'll write it up again, I guess. So the square is the universe of all things. <laughs> And inside the circle is everything that is under suitable pressure at time t. Right, so this is everything such that c of xt is true. Now, the predicate flex, or QM, so, right, everything that's QM is inside this circle. Is it clear why everything that's QM has to be inside that circle? Everything that flexes has to be under suitable pressure, because remember, the definition of flex was, is under suitable pressure and bends. So everything that flexes is inside this circle. So if we want to draw a picture of all the things that are QM, they're all going to be, it's, we're going to be taking a part of that circle out. And we can define another property Goodman we call not QM, 
which applies to everything in this circle that doesn't flex. Now, by the way, I mean, this is kind of non-standard notation, right? I'm applying the not, which really applies to a sentence, to a predicate instead. And um, it's just, uh, um, it might be better to just call this predicate Z or something instead of not QM, but it, I mean, it's, it's helpful to remember the relationship between these two. Right, so this predicate not QM then applies to everything in the circle that doesn't flex. That means it applies to everything that's under suitable pressure and doesn't bend. Neither QM nor not QM is true of anything that's outside the circle, of anything that's not under suitable pressure at time t. And remember, that's where the problem about flexible turns up, right? Inside this circle, these are the things that are flexible and these are the things that are not flexible. Right? Because if something is under suitable pressure and bends, then it's definitely flexible. And if something is under suitable pressure and doesn't bend, then it's definitely not flexible. So the line between flexible and inflexible inside the circle is this line. And Goodman says, what we want to do is project this line outside the circle. This is what he means by projection. So we want to draw a line that divides everything. And what's going to be on this side, right? So all of this together is going to be QD, that is flexible. And everything on the other side of the line is going to be inflexible. Now remember I said before I was going to say something else about why inacceptable rather than unacceptable. I think one reason is because he wants it to sound like inflexible. Um, it, because it turns out that acceptable and unacceptable are themselves dispositional predicates. <laughs> All right, but I'm not going to talk about that yet. So, um, all right, so the question is just how to do this, how to project this line out of the realm of things that are under suitable pressure and get it to divide everything. Right, so like a piece of rubber that's under suitable pressure and bending is going to be in this part here. A piece of rubber that's not under suitable pressure is going to be in this part here. It's outside the circle, but it's still flexible. And a steel beam um, that has never been under suitable pressure and never will be is going to be in this part here. Um, well, so I, I mean, I kind of implicitly started ignoring time there using Goodman's trick. It's, again, I think it's just an annoyance. I don't think it's a deep issue. You know, so I mean, yeah, let me not get boxed up on it. So, Basically, a steel beam that is not under suitable pressure is going to be out here, right? The fact that it's not bending, if it's not bending, I mean, maybe it is bending and it's under extraordinary pressure, right? But the fact that it's not bending, if it's not, is not can't tell us that it's inflexible. Um, but, uh, but thanks to the, the projection here, we're able to show that it's on the inflexible side in some other way without having tried to bend it. And that will solve the problem. And we'll solve the problem because um, QD, if it's right, this is the universe of everything, meaning according to Gibman, everything actual, right? He says there are no things that are possible and not actual. So 
this is the unit because again possible is an unacceptable predicate right so everything in the universe um, um, what was I gonna say um, oh right so QD if we can succeed in defining it this way um, is is going to be some actual characteristics that certain actual concrete things have and others don't right that is it's a predicate of actual concrete non-counterfactual it's a non-counterfactual predicate of actual concrete things so it's not unacceptable well it might be unacceptable for some other reason but anyway that's what we're worried about right now and how do we do this? So, I mean, we, we want to say that, um, that these out here are the same kind of things as these in there. Again, like the, you know, the way you might at first think about it is, you know, why do we call the rubber flexible even though it's not under suitable pressure? Well, because in here are pieces of rubber that are just like it, that are under suitable pressure and they're bending. So this is the same kind of thing as this and that's why we call this one flexible as well. Um, or even if that's not why we can preserve the extension of flexible by using that criterion. So, right, because maybe what we really do, maybe we really imagine counterfactual possibilities and all kinds of unacceptable nonsense when we, that's what we really, in some sense, mean by flexible. But when it turns, when you turn to which things we actually call flexible, what's in the extension of flexible, you know, the idea would be to say, well, the things we call flexible are the things that are the same kind as something that flexes. But the problem with that is that everything is the same kind as everything else, depending on how you define kinds. Right? That is, um, or as, you know, Goodman puts this in terms of set theory or class theory, right? Like, for any two things, there's some class that they both belong to. And that's what they have in common. So they're, they're the same kind of thing. Um, so, um, so just vaguely saying, oh, we want things that are the same kind as the things that flex is not going to do it. And instead, um, what we have to do is find some acceptable manifest predicates that always go to, inside this circle, always go along with flexing. And then we're going to define flexible as having those manifest predicates. So like, I mean, you could imagine it was something, at least if you allow these to be manifest predicates, imagine you had a list of all the flex types of flexible material, rubber, cloth, I guess that's flexible. Is that called bending or is that folding? Oh no. Anyway, rubber, certain kind of plastic, uh, you know, grass, whatever, all the things that are flexible. Um, you just have a list of all of them. So that your your manifest predicate is is either rubber or grass or cloth or this kind of plastic or etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I fill them all in, <laughs> right? Everything that that huge complicated predicate is true of that's inside the circle flexes, and everything that that huge complicated predicate is not true of, so it's not one of those things, but it's glass or stone or steel or whatever, that's inside the circle doesn't flex. And so we just define flexible as is either rubber or grass or cloth or blah, 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 blah. And then we apply it outside the circle as well. 
And that predicate doesn't contain any obvious counterfactuals or reference to non-actual possibles or reference to universals. It just says, you know, um, it's just a conjunction of like a huge number of regular manifest predicates. Now, I mean, and this is something that Goodman is discussing in that footnote that I uh, read before in other places. So really, like, is rubber, is that really a manifest predicate? Like, you know, um, at least in a phenomenalist system, you can only tell something is rubber by observing all kinds of stuff about it. And if, you know, so like, is rubber means, among other things, like, you know, if it's not painted, it will look black or, you know, something like that, right? Under, you know, normal lighting conditions. So, um, or is that true? Or is, look, is rubber naturally... Well, I don't know. I'm not sure what color rubber is naturally. Maybe it's kind of yellowish or something. But in any case, so uh, assume it's black if it's not painted, right? So, you know, like, and that's basically, a, that's a dispositional property or counterfactual, right? Because, you know, because what about things that are painted? Is that they would look black if they weren't painted, right? So, you know, the things we treat as manifest predicates, if you look into them further, might themselves be dis dispositional predicates. But anyway, I think you understand what the strategy would be. So in other words, we, 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 did, we find a new auxiliary predicate, Goodman calls it, and he calls it A, and A is a predicate that inside the circle, and it's not inacceptable, it's a fine predicate, and it's a predicate that inside the circle includes exactly the same things as QM. And then we just define QD flexible as A. So, um, and then Goodman, in the latter part of the chapter, and I almost thought maybe I shouldn't assign this next time I teach this course, although it's important, but the part where he talks about possibility, the passing of the possible, that's the title of the whole chapter, so obviously Goodman thinks it's important. But basically what he shows is that as a bonus, if we could figure out how to do this, we could um, we could get rid of those other inacceptable things, uh, counterfactuals and non-actual possibles also, because we could use disposition terms to define them and then use this strategy to get rid of, right? So he says like, you know, um, uh, You know, this place in the visual field that doesn't exist now could be blue, is possibly blue, means like blue is possibly space-timeable in, in a certain way. <laughs> or like if, a tr if the track had been missing, the train would have derailed means... Uh, the track was, the train was track missing derailable at time t. Right, so by introducing these weird dispositional predicates, we can get rid of possibility and counterfactuals as well. Um, now, I mean, we're left over with the question which Goodman says that uh, looks really hard actually, which is to tell in general terms how to find a suitable A for a given dispositional predicate. And he says, well, that looks really hard, but, and this is gonna come, this is gonna be important later. He says, um, that wouldn't stop us from finding a suitable A for some particular predicate. 
right? Like in the case of flexible, we don't really know what it is. We don't have that list of all flexible things that I suggested. We don't have a list of all the possible ways we might test to see if something is flexible. More could be discovered tomorrow, it seems like. We don't know exactly what to put on that list. So, um, and therefore, like, we don't know how to tell whether there is a list like that or not. Um, so we don't know how to tell whether we can eliminate that dispositional term flexible or not. But Goodman says, even though we can't solve the problem in this case, and we can't solve it in general, we might, there might be some special case where we can solve it. Okay, so that's, you know... Um, that, what I just said, is like the summary of, in, well, some, not just summary, but discussion of the Goodman's main point in this chapter. Are there questions about that? Because I want to go back to discussing the relationship between Carnap again a little bit, between Goodman and Carnap. Okay. So, um, so I said that before that this approach, as opposed to Carnap's approach with reduction sentences, is driven by this change about why we're trying to get rid of the unacceptable entities, or what, why we think entities are unacceptable, and why that's a problem. So, um, what is it that makes a basis acceptable? Right, going back to Goodman's explanation of the nature of philosophical problems at the beginning of chapter two, we want to provide an explanation for some otherwise unacceptable term on an acceptable basis. What makes a basis acceptable? So Carnap says, remember, well, um, we have to ask science, right? That is, if you want to know what are the things that we uh, evidently have a right to talk about, well, um, you know, what are the results of empirical psychology? That's what he says in the Aufbau. He shifts away from that a little bit in response to Neurath, but I think, as you can see, even in the methodological character um, paper, um, to the end, there's basically some version of that going on. And that's what rational reconstruction involves for Carnap. We're not um, suspicious, worried that scientists have let in some unacceptable things and we want to get rid of them or something like that. Um, basically, the, the situation of philosophy with respect to science is, as I said at the very, very beginning of the course, look, science looks like it's doing something right. What can we learn from this? Um, so if you want to know what kind of things you, you know, would be justified in talking about without further explanation, well, you know, ask science, what kind of things can beings like us know? Whereas Goodman says that science and common sense are not really to be trusted on this topic. And he says, um, oh, I didn't write down the page for this. It's a very important quote, but I'm not going to be able to find it and show it to you. But he, although I think maybe, is it on page 47? No. What he says is, um, oh wait, it's on page 32, I bet. Yes, here it is, page 32. Um,
I may not understand the devices I employ in making useful computations or predictions any more than the housewife understands the car she drives to bring home the groceries. So, um, um, everyday common sense and science are being compared to the housewife there. Right? They use these things and it works for them, but they don't know why it works. So, uh, so they're not reliable when it comes to asking, like, okay, um, why do you have a right to use this term, like flexible, let's say. You ask the scientist or the everyday person that, and all they can say is, well, it works. We, that is, we succeed in communicating using it. But they can't, but they don't know, I mean, if you ask them, well, why? All they can say is, well, what's wrong with it? You know, <laughs> it works. So along comes philosophy, and it's not clear whether philosophy is being compared to a mechanic or an engineer or a physicist. Um, but in any case, it's definitely a man. It's not a housewife. Um, this is 1953 again, and Goodman um, and Quine both, especially Quine, but I think also Goodman, are considerably more conservative politically than Carnap is. Um, so given both of those reasons, it's not so surprising that Goodman is thinking about it in this sexist way. But um, not surprising, but I don't think irrelevant. <laughs> right. So in any case, right, so philosophy, who is some kind of male expert, has to ask what makes the car work. Um, okay. But therefore, if we can't ask science then, how do we know which terms are acceptable and which are unacceptable? We can't rely on science because we're trying to explain why science works. Um, and science doesn't know why it works. So, um, so how do we know which terms are acceptable and which are not? Well, this is where Goodman appeals to what he calls philosophical conscience. And it's at least a metaphor for, to, to take, treat this as an ethical issue, but I think it's at least worth keeping in mind that he really thinks of it as an ethical and perhaps political issue. Philosophical conscience, um, it's not Kantian ethics. <laughs> We're not appealing to a principle. We have a kind of feeling that certain things are acceptable and certain things are not. It appears, at least. Now, that may not be the end of the story for Goodman and especially for Quine, but at least that's the way he sounds like he's talking about it. Um, that's how we're going to decide what's acceptable and what's not. And therefore, rather than trying to give you a definition, he says, actually, right, since the end of the verification theory of meaning, we have not, we've given up on finding a good definition. But he says, I'll give you a list of things that I find unacceptable, and it's counterfactuals, possibles, disposition terms, and um, classes or sets, right? And then he does in another, devils and angels. That one's kind of weird. It doesn't obviously go with the other ones. I mean, you might think that that's not unacceptable, but just there aren't any, according to Goodman. But apparently, no, he thinks it's a problem to ask whether there are any devils or angels. Um, that it's, you know, there's something unclear about the, the term, basically. Um, that's what his philosophical conscience tells him. Well, um, and this is where I'm going to point out 
Oops, I only have one minute left, but I am going to say this, and maybe I'll come into a little bit more detail at the beginning next time. That suppose we take seriously that acceptable and inacceptable are dispositional predicates themselves. What are they projecting? Um, so you might say something like, um, in this circle is everything that um, has been considered by we scientific men. And um, within this circle, we're going to draw a line between the things which have been accepted and the things which have been rejected. Right, so now what's equivalent to flexes is like has traditionally been accepted. And what we might want acceptable to mean is that if we scientific men or others like us were to consider this predicate, we would accept it, right? So all of this is acceptable. And what we want to have on the other side of the line is what, if it were carefully considered by we scientific men or others like us, would be rejected. And the question is how to project That's the question of, so this, of getting that general rule that corresponds to our philosophical conscience. We don't have that general rule. We can only give examples of the ones we've considered and accepted or the ones we've considered and rejected. But we would like the general rule that will tell us you know, what these all have in common such that if the, we were to consider them, we would, such that some others that we haven't considered yet might also have that and those would be acceptable. We don't know that, but that's what we're looking for. And, ugh, I'm two minutes over. So I'll just say, notice how inherently conservative that is, if that's really what we're doing. OK, so I'll talk more about that next time, I guess. I'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>